I'm here with Jack and Jeannie Welsh to talk a little bit about their new book, The Parables of Jesus Revealing the Plan of Salvation. So I'd just like to ask you a few questions about the book and get a little bit of information about what it's about. So what inspired you both to write a book on the parables? Well, that's a great question, Jonathan. Uh, inspiration comes in ways we, you know, we don't always anticipate. Uh, but uh, for many years, we've been interested in the parables of Jesus for a lot of reasons, but uh, raising our children, our grandchildren, loving the New Testament. I can remember when Jeannie and I were young, had our first couple children in North Carolina, and uh, running across books like uh, Jeremias's book on the parables of Jesus, and uh, many other books like that along the way have yeah enriched our lives, and uh, a couple things happened, at least to me. One was I wanted to present the parables of Jesus in a way that Latter-day Saints could really see the richness and the depth of, uh, of the parables. There are many books written about the uh, parables, and some by Latter-day Saints, but uh, I, I wanted to do one that was a little more personal from our perspective, and, and I guess the other thing that uh, you know, when you do a book, you do have an audience in mind, right. many of them probably, and, yeah. and uh, my grandchildren were always a big part of my vision for this book, and yeah. so it's dedicated to them. That's awesome. I, I think, uh, as Jack had said, the Jeremias book and the C.S. Lewis book on the Psalms mm -hmm. as well, anything that provided extra details that gave us new insights into better understanding the parables. They're very simple stories, and yet they can be understood on multiple levels. And I think extra details that gave you an aha moment of getting more out of them has been interesting to us from the beginning. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So tell us a little bit about the book. How is this book different than any other book I could go get at the store about the parables? As far as I know, there has never been a book that has tried to see all the parables in a, a unified whole, as a sequence. Yeah, okay, yeah. And so I've always looked for coherence. If Jesus taught all of these parables, what was it that uh, held them together? And my initial work on the parable of the Good Samaritan made it uh, clear, at least to me, that Jesus was teaching what we might call the plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. And I then started looking for the plan of salvation in other parables. And what became clear finally was that the parable of the Good Samaritan, in a way, is the master parable. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then each of the other parables uh, emphasizes and teaches a more specific doctrine, a part of the plan of salvation. Yeah. And when you put the whole string of parables together, you get then the full teaching of Jesus on the plan of salvation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I don't think any book has ever done that before. Yeah, that's great. We also were inspired by a quote from Joseph Smith, who said in the teachings of the prophet Joseph Smith, if you want to understand the parable, look to what question drew the parable out. Yeah. And so I, one of the things that we explore in every parable right at the beginning is either the question or the circumstances. What happened just before this? Who asked the question? What might have been their motivation in asking the question? And frequently that revealed a great deal about the purpose of what the parable was. Also, um, we looked in every parable where, where is Jesus Christ? Because he paints himself. He is, even when it's simply an allegory, he is usually one of the major figures or symbolized by something in the parable. So the three main points would be, where is this parable? Where does it figure in the plan of salvation? Where is Jesus in this parable? And what was it that drew out this parable? What was the instigator of the, the um, main idea of the parable? Yeah, and as Jeannie said, and one thing that she found in our uh, reading and research was uh, another statement by Joseph Smith. Mm -hmm. uh, in introducing his comments on the parable of the talents, yeah. 
Joseph Smith himself said that one thing we must bear in mind if we're going to understand this parable is the plan of salvation. That's great, that's great. So it's uh, bringing all of these together. That so we're on good ground. So he's, he's made the connections too, yeah. yeah. Sometimes when I look at the question that prompted the parable, and I look, then look at the parable in a very superficial way, I go, well, what does this have to do with the question? But when you look at it with the plan of salvation, it does actually answer the question. Mm -hmm. That was a beautiful realization. And one thing that uh, we found is that sometimes more than one question yes, drew yes. out the parable. Yeah. And the uh, Good Samaritan is a good example of that yeah. uh, because there were actually two questions. Uh, the, the lawyer came and said, good master, what must I do to obtain eternal life? That's question number one. And then, of course, Jesus says, well, how do you read? And he gives the, uh, the two great commandments, thou shalt love the Lord thy God and thy neighbor as thyself. And yeah. that's part of that. And then the next question is asked by the lawyer, and who is my neighbor? Mm -hmm. And uh, lawyers should know know better than to ask questions they don't know the answer to because uh, but he he asked two questions yeah. and what's interesting to me in that case is that Jesus then answers the the second question who is my neighbor mm -hmm. by telling the story of the good samaritan yeah. but in the process he also answers the first question yes, yes. which is and what do i need to do to obtain eternal yes. life in other words tell me the plan of salvation yeah. Yeah. which is a characteristic, as Jeannie is saying, of the parables, they can all be read at multiple levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And looking at the situation, looking at the questions, looking at the people, their needs, helps you to understand all of the different nuances and levels that the parable can be read at. And you can add your own yeah, right. as you read it. And if you have ears to hear and eyes to see, you too will understand if you know how the parable is to be used. That, that is what is an important characteristic of the parable. In its very simplicity, it's applicable to all time and to all places. Yeah. So what was applicable to those who were hearing it from the very lips of the Savior mm -hmm. is also something that can be applied to us today, something that we can learn from and change our behavior because of this. So it's something so universal. That's why they are appealing, understandable for very young children, but also certainly very important for us today at wherever we are in our life. That is really beautiful. So let's talk a little bit more about the structure of the book. So how many, how many parables did you include? Did you try to include all the parables of Jesus? Well, how many are there? Jonathan. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> and how do you count them? <laughs> right, right. What counts as a parable? Yeah. And, uh, and sometimes a parable may uh, actually be two parables in yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. It's very difficult to define. Right. Some parables are very short, like yeah. ye are the salt of the earth, <laughs> right. or a city on a hill cannot be hid, or don't put your lamp under a bushel. Mm -hmm. uh, are those parables or metaphors? Actually, I, I think they're all consistent with Jesus' use of real-life experiences yeah. to teach profound eternal doctrines yeah. and to inspire not just faith and belief and ideas, but action and doing and keeping the commandments and actually being the kind of people that we should be. Yeah. So, uh, how many there are I don't know. At the end of the book, we, we include a table mm -hmm. or a chart. Mm -hmm. I love charts, as you know. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, there are 68 parables on okay, that chart. chart. Okay. Uh, and uh, about half of them are treated in the book itself, yeah. okay. although many of them are mentioned in passing. Mm -hmm. uh, so maybe there's another volume there's here another yet book. to be done. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's great. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the Bible, the scriptures are all so open-ended to, uh, uh, to touch all of our hearts and souls yeah. that uh, uh, how many, O oh Lord, how long, O oh Lord, <laughs> it's, that's why we say it's eternal. Yes, yes, yeah. oh, good, good. 
Well, to go back to how you used all the parables in, each, in the chapters, how is the book broken up exactly? Well, the first thing we've done is we've used the plan of salvation as the organizing principle. Okay. Yeah. And so we begin with the most important, what is the, uh, the, the core doctrine of the gospel? It's uh, recognizing Jesus Christ as the, uh, our Lord and Savior. Yeah. And uh, so the uh, parable of the woman at the well. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a parable? Well, for us, when he's talking about living water, yeah. that's already a parable, although it's, it's actually based on a real conversation with a real person. And you wonder how many of the parables maybe were being drawn out of human experiences in Jesus' communities. Yeah. Uh, but uh, beginning with that, then we, uh, we go from the premortal existence, uh, which uh, is discussed in uh, especially the parable of the two sons, yeah. uh, where a certain man had two sons, and one was willing to do the will of his father, and the other was not. Yeah. And Jesus tells that parable in answer to two questions. Mm -hmm. By what authority are you doing all of these miracles? Yeah. And who gave you that authority? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Jesus, of course, uh, is asking the chief priests, and they refuse to answer. And so Jesus says, well, then I, I'm not going to tell you a straight answer, but how about a story? Yeah, yeah. And I think they understood that he was talking about uh, what we would consider the premortal council. Yep. And how did Jesus get his authority? It was in that council. Yeah. And the Apostle Paul even talks about uh, the mystery, the wisdom of God, that was uh, prepared from the foundation of the world. So we know that Jesus and the early Christians were aware of, the, of Jesus' pre-mortal calling to, uh, and his life and work, first as Jehovah in, uh, and then in the flesh as Jesus. So then we go from that point uh, on to the parable of the sower, mm -hmm. where seeds are now started and we have a beginning here on this earth in the flesh. And then we go on into different principles of opposition and choice and accountability. And every, you think of a parable and you can position it then. So that's the organizing outline of the book. Well, another important feature that we have in the book is that with each of the parables that we discuss, there are paintings by Jorge Coco Sant'Angelo. Yeah. Uh, we had commissioned these paintings. Jack and I had both talked to him in the development of the paintings. We talked to him before he began the painting, and then during, he would send us sketches, and we would react and talk to him about that. So, um, so we have the painting also. In every chapter, we um, note the, the scripture, the pertinent scripture for that. Um, sometimes, if they're very, very similar in some of the Gospels, then we will only feature the one if it's almost identical yeah. to another one. As we, we do have the King James um, scripture noted, although Jack uh, will add if there's interpretive differences of Greek words particularly mm -hmm. that make a difference in understanding your meanings, yeah, yeah. that some of those additions will be noted so that uh, you can more fully understand what the scripture is. In addition, we used some interpretation from the New Testament commentary, particularly that, that was done of Luke by Kent Brown and Mark by Julie Smith, oh, yeah, yeah. along with if a general authority has spoken about a parable in general conference. So all of these things were um, mixed in as appropriately. Um, so that those were some of the additions that we put into our commentary for each of the parables. Yeah. And then we added our own thoughts and ideas. That's great. That's great. As I said to somebody, it's been a very long conversation as mm -hmm. we um, have been working on this over a, a long period of time, at least a couple of very intense years. Yeah. Well, that was probably a really great experience for the two of you to be able to work on something like this together. Absolutely. And uh, 
you know, I, I strongly believe that uh, any writer should uh, submit drafts and get feedback yeah. and reactions. Yeah. And so as I would uh, take material that Jeannie had collected and organize it into a rough draft of the paper, mm. we'd go back and forth three or four times yeah. on yeah. trying to, uh, you know, what to include, what's important, how to emphasize it. And it was a, a, a wonderful experience. Yeah. You mentioned briefly about Jorge Coco and the artwork in the book. How did you meet him? How did that come about that you commissioned Jorge to do these paintings? Uh, I first became aware of him when he submitted a painting a few years ago to the international art competition that the church oh, runs yeah, yeah. and won first place. Okay, yeah. Now, he's not young. Uh, he's had a long career as an artist and a member of the church in Argentina. He studied in Spain and Mexico. Oh, yeah. But this is a new style that was really quite uh, impressive to people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's called, uh, he calls it sacro-cubism. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And you can see some Spanish influences and others in what he does. Yeah. Uh, I first uh, became personally aware of him when we invited him to come and speak to the BYU Studies Academy meeting mm -hmm. where he displayed a lot of his paintings about the life of Christ. Oh, that's great. And there are calendars and posters and lots of things now that are uh, familiar to people. Yeah. Um, I said to him, this is, it was very engaging to me. And I thought, this abstract style mm -hmm. fits perfectly with the abstractness of parables. Yeah. Yeah. A parable is trying to get right to the essence of, of a particular teaching or problem. And abstract art tries to get you to just think hard about what do I see in this mm -hmm. and what is the most important uh, principle or uh, realization that I want to come away with. Mm -hmm. So I asked him if uh, he would be interested in working with me on parables. Yeah. And uh, he, he said, well, I've never painted a parable, so <laughs> let's go at it. Yeah. Now, in fact, uh, I'm sure he had studied, as many do, the, the artwork of parables. Uh, almost all famous artists have taken a crack at a parable yeah. or two. Yeah. Uh, Rembrandt does the uh, return of the prodigal son. And, yes, uh, yes. and in the Chartres Cathedral, there's the whole Good Samaritan window. And uh, we've traveled in many places uh, in Europe looking for art of the parables. Yeah, yeah. It's not always easy to find, uh, but uh, even Van Gogh uh -huh. painted a, a, a painting of uh, actually showing himself as the, uh, the person who needed to be rescued and uh, the, had fallen among the robbers. Oh, it's okay. one of his last paintings. Oh, that's great. But no one, as far as I know, had ever really tried to do a whole series of all of them in a consistent form and yeah, yeah. With, with an underlying uh, artistic theory and principle, which is what we brought together in this series. And so it, it is really quite unique yeah. and I think works, works very well. Yeah, that's a real contribution. The reaction has been uh, very positive. Well, his abstract style is perfectly, coincides perfectly with the, the, uh, the aims of the parables, mm -hmm. which is the universality of, it, of their appeal. Yeah. Because the, the abstractness takes away any particular reference to a geographical space or a, a particular time, that what you see is it's stripped down, just like a parable, stripped down to simply the essence of the story, which enables I, the viewer to relate to more put himself or herself into the situation. Plus, <clears throat> Coco is a sensitive spiritual man. He, he was converted as a young man um, just after his marriage, was very much seeking for the gospel, Re literally prayed the missionaries to his door, and has been a faithful, faithful member ever since. And he, um, he believes that all art should reflect something good. 
and he's essentially a very optimistic person. Yeah. And the, the messages of the parables are essentially hopeful and optimistic. Even those that talk about the separation um, are still essentially hopeful for the final judgment with yeah. God's mercy overshadowing everything. Yeah. And so I think his vision captures really well the vision of the Savior. And I might also add that uh, being from Argentina, he spoke Spanish. Mm. And so we had a communication challenge. Uh -huh. And uh, fortunately, Jeannie speaks good enough Spanish and his son Emil speaks good enough English that we, we had conferences mm -hmm. and meetings sometimes when they were here in Utah. We, uh, we get together and go over the drawings and the sketches and the drafts and talk about ideas. And it was a collaborative, a very personal and spiritual experience for all of us. So who would you say the book is designed for? Who is this book written for? Mm. Well, most of all, I think it's directed to our children and grandchildren, yeah. our children as they teach their children. Yeah. We are very much, we have 17 grandchildren and we're very involved as grandparents and parents with them. And we most of all wanted to convey our understanding to these young people there and how wonderful that the Come Follow Me program, of course we began much before we knew anything about this, but the Teach Them at Home program has been a wonderful springboard to um, take this kind of material and interact with the family about it. And already we've yeah. seen incredible results in, in our own family. That's an encouraging sign that anybody could try and could pick this up, trying to do the Come Follow Me lesson and work on it with their family. That's really great. But I'd also say that uh, I want the book to be uh, uh, useful for anyone studying the scriptures yeah. Yeah. at any level. Yeah. Uh, what we get uh, in the, uh, the commentary portion of each one of the chapters is, uh, I wouldn't call it an exhaustive uh, coverage of the possible interpretations, but we try to give people tools, linguistic tools, mm -hmm. uh, uh, theoretical tools. Parables have been approached in so many different ways, and, yeah. and what we hope to do is open people's awareness uh, so that as they read a paragraph or a section, they say, I've never thought of it quite that way before, and that's a good thing. Yeah. So we're, our audience is... Uh, uh, people who are looking for la greater light of knowledge, you might say, yeah. Yeah. and uh, want the latest information uh, so that, uh, you know, we're aware of uh, academic uh, discourse on the parables. And uh, I will say that uh, one of my uh, conclusions from the work that I've done here is that most people, uh, scholars, when they read the parables, they treat them as isolated individual speeches yeah, yeah. Or, or comments. And by doing that, they, they do sever it from the, the, the immediate context a little bit too much. Mm -hmm. But more than that, uh, they run into a problem as commentators and interpreters because they see each one of them as dealing with a separate concept and therefore they even sometimes yeah. conclude that well maybe Jesus didn't write this parable. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a story that grew up uh, around Jesus, sort of the kind of thing he might have said but uh, without really having much confidence that Jesus actually said this thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but when you have the larger plan of salvation context what comes first, the individual interpretation or the, or the overall uh, big picture? And one of the parables we use in the beginning of the book is uh, the idea of a box of puzzle pieces. You know, you have the picture on the box, and then you dig into the puzzle, all the pieces, and each piece does look like an independent piece. And you have a hard time putting them all together. But if you know the picture on the box, then you can 
figure out where the hard pieces go and they actually do fit in. Yeah, right, right. And that's been our experience and we hope that an audience wanting to see coherence yeah. and put the, uh, the teachings of Jesus into a, a harmonious uh, context uh, brought together uh, by what appears to be his mission and teachings mm -hmm. and, and the bigger messages of the New Testament we would hope they would uh, find the answers to some of the questions they've been wondering about. Yeah. The disciples ask Jesus, why do you speak in parables? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and the Savior gives the answer, eyes to see and ears to hear, but he says to the disciples, uh, unto you has been revealed the mystery, or sometimes it's said the mysteries, um, and now you understand. And we think that the mystery was the plan of salvation. They have the understanding, and therefore, they can see. Mm -hmm. And uh, what we want to do is help people feel like they, too, have seen, and it has been revealed unto them, the plan, the plan of salvation, so yeah. they know the mystery. And I do think that once you see the coherence of the entire plan, where you see how they all fit. You not only understand, but I think that you are able to remember them better. You are able to see the end from the beginning and know how it all works and why it was said the way it was. And let me say, some people think of the word mystery and they think of uh, you know, mystery novels. Yes, or, yes. Uh, but in the ancient world and in the New Testament times, uh, the word mystery, mysterion, uh, has to do with revelation, the muses, yes. and uh, is the root of that word, and, uh, and that the, the word should better be translated as sacred wisdom, yeah. Yeah. wisdom that wasn't readily known or shared except in holy situations. And so for Jesus to have said to his disciples, uh, unto you has been given uh, the understanding and therefore you can uh, recognize what I'm saying and why. Well, if it's not the plan of salvation, if it's not something like that, you have to wonder, well, what's he talking about? Yeah, yeah. And I think this is uh, probably the best answer to that question. So how do these parables help you understand Jesus Christ and help you come to him? They help in many ways, but particularly when you realize the voice of Jesus, when you are hearing him expressing his deepest concerns and interests, you begin to well draw closer to him than you might just uh, as you think about him as a, a person who lived long ago or maybe is now resurrected and is not in your life so often. Mm -hmm. But in his teachings, in the parables, he, and he tells us he cares about the lost sheep. He tells us that he wants us to stay on the straight and narrow path. He tells us that he'll help us, that our little mustard seed can grow into a, a marvelous plant that will become a shelter for all kinds of, of sanctified birds and, and eternal life. Mm -hmm. It helps me to know the many things that Jesus wants us to do. Uh, repentance is not a simple process. And a complicated story like the parable of the prodigal son mm -hmm. goes through a lot of the steps of repentance and how Eventually, he did come to himself. Uh, the parables tell us that the lost sheep will be rescued, but the sheep that can take care of themselves, the sheep need the, the Savior to come out and rescue them because they, they are so helpless, they cannot rescue themselves. Yeah, yeah. But as human beings, uh, we're not like the lost coin. The coin cannot save the coin's self. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, we as prodigals need to come to ourselves and then go through the, the steps of repentance, which 
will end with, of course, a marvelous reunion with the Father who will see us returning a long way off. All of these little details help me to understand Jesus' character, his behavior, his, his deepest desires for us. And they are, after all, called the parables of Jesus. And I think that word of, like the love of Christ, doesn't just mean parables that he taught, that belong to him. They are parables about Jesus as well. So why are there so many? To sort of conclude, why are there so many parables? There are so many parables because I, th I think because there are so many doctrines. Uh, the doctrines of the kingdom are taught in abundance. Uh, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be reduced to a single factor. That's a little too platonic, uh, where Plato tried to reduce everything to one supreme uh, philosophical concept, yeah, yeah. the good. Mm -hmm. uh, for Jesus, and I think for the gospel, the, there are so many stages in the plan of salvation, and life is progression, yeah. that we are progressing toward an eternal goal, and we need to know the steps in that ladder that takes us to heaven. Mm -hmm. And there's a parable for each one of those steps or stages. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that we, ha we have to realize that in the gospel, we, we can't become so fastidious and, and, and so focused on a single doctrine to the exclusion of others. Yeah. Uh, that we, uh, uh, we then actually end up being kind of at war within ourselves over these doctrines that we are trying to exclude but are trying to bring themselves into our life for our benefit. As Elder Maxwell once said, the, uh, uh, the doctrines of the kingdom of God need each other as much as we as human beings need each other. And they thrive together, and they interrelate. And I think that's why there are so many parables, is to build those connections and help us with our corrections. Mm 